Hey friends, welcome back to Grand Adventure. I'm your host, Mark Guido, and this week we're gonna take a whirlwind look back at what a strange year 2020 was, but yet, nevertheless, what a great camping season it yielded for us to share with you. So stay tuned. Now, I kind of doubt that anybody's going to argue that 2020 was a very strange year. And now, please understand, I don't mean to minimize the corona coronavirus pandemic in any way. Uh, clearly, it affected many people in very many negative ways, and it's been a burden upon our nation and our world throughout 2020. However, I will say, from an RV travel perspective, there were a couple of surprisingly positive outcomes to the situation that we all found ourselves in this year. Uh, for one thing, gasoline was dirt cheap. Uh, and when you're towing and getting six or seven miles per gallon like we do when we're towing, that's kind of a, a good thing. Uh, for another, many destinations that are often packed and swarmed with tourists were shockingly empty and dead this year. So in a strange sort of way. We got to see some places this year with a complete lack of people that we would not normally enjoy that opportunity. Finally, this year we got to make friends with lots of new folks on the road and also get to see some old friends too. So this was a very enjoyable year for us to be able to meet friends and see friends as we were out traveling the country. Now, this week's episode of Grand Adventure is going to be a high-speed journey through our entire 2020 camping season. We're going to be top sheeting only each destination in a quick, fast-paced episode to bring you from start to finish. So if you want to learn more about any of these destinations in detail, if you visit the video description down below, you'll find links to each individual episode as well as our entire 2020 playlist. Our plan had been to ski through the end of the season at Out the Ski Area in Utah, which typically wraps things up for the winter around the end of April. On the night of March 14th, however, in a span of less than 24 hours, nearly all of the ski resorts in the U.S. decided one after the other to shut down due to the blossoming COVID-19 pandemic. We had to decide if we were going to lock ourselves down or continue on with our travel plans. For us, that decision was an easy one. Once ski season ended prematurely, I decided to start Grand Adventures travel season nearly two months ahead of schedule. I wanted to visit some areas of Southern Arizona that are usually already too hot by the time ski season closes. So while Patricia had to remain in Utah for work, I hitched up to the trailer, grabbed Zoe and headed south. I decided that I'd drive straight through to the most distant point that I'd visit on this early swing through the desert southwest, then slowly work my way back to Utah to retrieve Patricia for our summer travel. It's a long two-day drive from Salt Lake City to southeastern Arizona, so we stopped overnight at Lone Rock Beach, a dispersed camping area within Glen Canyon National Recreation Area on Lake Powell. Camping there was busy. Little did I realize that the National Park Service would close Lone Rock Beach due to coronavirus mere days later. For episode 143, I finally got to see a place that had long been on my list, Tombstone, Arizona. Tombstone's place in Western folklore was cemented by the gunfight at the OK Corral, where lawman Virgil Morgan and Wyatt Earp, alongside legendary gunslinger Doc Holliday, shot dead three outlaw cowboys. Our first stop will be spent boondocking within Coronado National Forest at the foot of the rugged Dragoon Mountains, about 10 miles north of town.
March is normally high season in Tombstone, when it's usually tough to find a place to park, much less find the town nearly deserted. A few stubborn shopkeepers kept their doors open, but by and large, the town was closed for business. That, however, didn't keep me from seeing the places in town that previously existed only in the folklore that I had read. While we were still camped outside of Tombstone, we visited nearby Bisbee to film our episode 134. Less than eight miles from the Mexican border, Bisbee was founded as a copper, gold, and silver mining town in 1880 and named in honor of Judge DeWitt Bisbee, one of the financial backers of the adjacent Copper Queen mine. Because its plan was laid out to a pedestrian scale before the automobile, Old Bisbee is compact and walkable and not a place to drive your RV. Mining in the Mule Mountains proved quite successful. In the early 20th century, the population of Bisbee soared to more than 9,000. In 1917, open pit mining was successfully introduced to meet the copper demand during World War I. Mining operations in Bisbee ceased in 1975, and heritage tourism replaced mining as Bisbee's economic driver. Bisbee became a haven for artists and hippies fleeing the larger cities of Arizona and California. Today, the historic city of Bisbee is known as Old Bisbee and is home to a thriving downtown cultural scene, but not during the early days of the COVID pandemic. Like Tombstone just a few miles to the north, Bisbee was largely deserted in March. While in southern Arizona, the next logical stop was Tucson, where I wanted to spend some time with our friend and fellow YouTuber T.R. Bolin and explore Saguaro National Park for our episode 145. Together with TR, I got to hike the beautiful Sonoran Desert landscape right from our adjacent campsites at an RV park in Tucson Estates. Separately from TR, I went from a mini blizzard atop Mount Lemon overlooking the city, to the Erie Aircraft Boneyard at Pinal Air Park, to the historic Spanish mission, San Xavier del Bac. TR served as my tour guide within both Tucson Mountain County Park and Saguaro National Park West. After tearing the pads of her paws on sharp gravel, Zoe had her first experience wearing booties. I'm not sure that she enjoyed it. Leaving Tucson, it was time to connect with more friends. This time I'd join our Utah friends and neighbors Kay and Arnie at Lost Dutchman State Park, east of Tucson, to film our episode 146. Lost Dutchman is one of Arizona's most popular state parks, and it's easy to see why. All 138 campsites, complete with water and electric hookups, have stunning views of the nearby Superstition Mountains. The park is named for the fabled Lost Dutchman's Gold Mine, which according to legend, is a rich gold mine hidden in the Superstition Mountains east of Phoenix that many have tried to find for over 100 years. Lost Dutchman has a number of terrific hiking trails that head into the Superstition Mountains right from the campground. While there, I also had the opportunity to explore the Apache Trail, a remote two-lane desert highway that winds through the Superstition Mountain Desert for a lonely 46 miles. When we aired our episode 146, I didn't share with our viewers just how close I came that day to losing Zoe. The Apache Trail is incredibly picturesque, and I was stopping constantly to shoot video footage for Grand Adventure. After perhaps my 15th stop, over roughly the same number of desert miles, I reached behind the driver's seat to pet Zoe, and she wasn't there. Panic set in immediately. I flipped the truck around, and I raced back to stop at each and every place that I had stopped to film. For somewhere along the way, Zoe had exited the truck. I thought about her wandering around in the desert until she perished. I had thought about someone picking her up and bringing her home with them. After about 15 minutes, 
my phone rang as I passed through the one spot that had any modicum of cell service. Zoe had been running in the direction that the truck disappeared in and stopped traffic in both directions as she ran across a one-lane bridge. A thoughtful local picked her up and he was now calling me. Zoe got a big bowl of ice cream that night. Reunited with Zoe once again, we needed a couple of days to catch our breath and catch up on video editing. We found blazing fast cell service at the foot of Saddle Mountain, boondocking on BLM land in Tonopah, 50 miles west of Phoenix, for our episode 147. Refreshed, we turned the truck back north and headed up to Prescott for episode 148. Historic Prescott was once home to both Virgil Orp and Doc Holliday. Today, it's home to thick pine forests, high desert, beautiful hikes, and stellar RV camping, including our boondocking site in the Bradshaw Mountains of Prescott National Forest south of town. Still trying to make things good with Zoe, together we hike to the top of Mount Union to drink in the views of the forested Bradshaw Mountains and the desert landscape beyond. We also hiked together to the giant alligator juniper tree, an informal memorial to the 19 men of the Granite Mountain Hotshots who died fighting the Yarnell Hill fire near here in 2013. But we were chased out of the Bradshaw Mountains by a forecast that called for a spring snowstorm at higher elevations. So Zoe and I retreated to the comfort of an RV park at a much lower elevation in Camp Verde for our episode 149. There are several national monuments surrounding Camp Verde, including the Puebloan ruins of Tuzagut National Monument shown here. However, by this time, the coronavirus pandemic was in full swing, and the Park Service had closed these national monuments all to visitation. Camp Verde is also just downhill from the historic mining town of Jerome, which sits on a shoulder of the Mingus Mountains. Supported in its heyday by rich copper mines, it was home to more than 10,000 people in the 1920s. Today, however, its population has dwindled to less than 500, 
and locals now mine tourism instead of copper to fuel their economy. Jerome became a National Historic Landmark in 1967, and visitors today will find art galleries, coffee houses, restaurants, a state park, and a local museum devoted to mining history. In early April, Jerome is typically buzzing with tourists. Coronavirus had closed most businesses in town, and the few that remained open enjoyed very few visitors during our time in Jerome. From Camp Verde, it wasn't far to travel to our episode 150 from the famed towering red rock cliffs of Sedona. In fact, it was close enough that we got to spend time at our boondocking site in the Coconino National Forest outside of Sedona with Ed and Ann of the YouTube channel Homie at Large, whom we had befriended while staying in Camp Verde. My due date back in Salt Lake City was getting closer. And after crossing back into Utah, I headed for Cannonville, where friends and fellow YouTubers John and Joanne Tardiff of the channel Scenic Driveways were staying at the local KOA just outside of Bryce Canyon National Park. It was now mid-April, and coronavirus had closed nearly all U.S. national parks, including Bryce. No matter, though, for some of my favorite sites in the area are actually outside of the national park. So we move forward with filming our episode 151, Bryce Canyon Country.
I arrived back in Salt Lake City right on schedule. However, Patricia's job wasn't yet ready for us to leave, so Zoe and I snuck back to the red rock of the southern Utah desert just outside of St. George to film episode 153 with my friend and colleague, Dan. Well, we found ourselves camped right next to the fine folks behind Loving Our Freedom on Instagram. Finally, Patricia was ready to head out for a summer of camping, but COVID-19 had other ideas. Our plan had been to slowly work our way eastward to Quebec to visit Patricia's family, but now the U.S. and Canadian governments had reached an agreement to close the land border between the two countries to all non-essential travel. Making matters even worse, a number of states, particularly those in the eastern half of the U.S., were closing campgrounds along with other businesses. Just days before our departure, we had to retool our entire summer's worth of travel. Thus was born our American Heartland Tour 2020. We'd still head east, but we'd stick to states with the loosest lockdown orders. With boondocking opportunities scarce east of the Rockies, we hurriedly booked several months worth of campgrounds in the span of just a few days and headed out. Our first stop would be our last boondocking spot for a while, Pine Ridge, in the surprisingly beautiful northwestern corner of Nebraska, where we'd film our episode 154. We began our long string of campground stays over the Memorial Day holiday weekend in beautiful Pierre, South Dakota, the second tiniest state capital in the U.S. Situated on the banks of the Missouri River, Pierre is surrounded by both rich history and remarkably diverse outdoor recreation, perfect for our episode 155.
We found a terrific little 12 site town campground right on the river in Fort Pierre, where we had the good fortune to find viewer Lindy Thompson as our next door neighbor. Knowing that we were traveling across the Northern Plains, Patricia insisted upon stopping in Aberdeen to pay homage to her friend Stephanie, the co-pilot of the plane that crashed near Aberdeen nearly 21 years earlier, killing all on board, including professional golfer Payne Stewart. Patricia tracked down farmer John Hoffman, who graciously agreed to lead us to the crash site on his sprawling land for the opening segment of our episode 156. While in Aberdeen, we stayed at another town park, Wiley Park. How many campgrounds do you know that come paired with their own free amusement park? By the time we got to Sioux Falls, we experienced our first trailer wheel bearing failure and axle replacement of 2020. Our episode 157 thus began unplanned in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, before continuing on to the Sioux City, Iowa area for its conclusion at another charming tiny town park right on the banks of the Missouri River in Dakota City, Nebraska.
I've long been curious about the Ozark Mountains, so we continued heading southeast to Lake of the Ozarks in central Missouri for episode 158. Over 5 million people visit the Lake of the Ozarks annually, and with 1,150 miles of shoreline, there's something to satisfy virtually every outdoor recreationalist. While camping for a week at the Osage Beach RV Park, we spent our free time kayaking, hiking, and exploring this area of Missouri's northern Ozark Mountains, including Lake of the Ozark State Park, Haha ha Tonka State Park, and the area surrounding Bagnell Dam. Our next move carried us across the mighty Mississippi River, officially crossing into the eastern half of the U.S. with our RV for the very first time, to visit the Music City for our episode 159. We camped just outside of the city on J. Percy Priest Lake at a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers campground, another first for us, while we explored the sights and sounds of Nashville and spent some time kayaking right from camp. Our next stop would be the furthest east we would travel. With North Carolina tightly locked down, we ended our eastern movement in Weirs Valley in eastern Tennessee to visit Great Smoky Mountains National Park for our episode 160. With 11 million visitors annually, it's the most visited national park in the United States. Visitors flock to the park for its fog and shrouded peaks, unique Appalachian culture and history, abundant wildlife, thick green forests, bubbling mountain streams, and spectacular waterfalls.
While in Weirs Valley, we were blessed to get to know Susan and Jim Bates of the YouTube channel New Horizons over a couple of successive evenings. Our episode 161 would connect us with fellow YouTubers as well. Lookout Mountain lies partially in three different states, Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee, rising to nearly 2,400 feet above sea level. It's a broad, steep-sided, flat-top mountain reaching north to the doorstep of Chattanooga and is home to tourist attractions including the caves of Ruby Falls, the heavily advertised city of Rocks, an incline railway, and Civil War points of interest, along with Cloudland Canyon State Park. While in the state park's campground, we met our next door neighbors, viewers Katie and Dwayne Yoder, who run their own YouTube channel, Chosen Adventures. But our stop on Lookout Mountain was a planned rendezvous with Floridians Tom and Cindy Bradshaw, who along with their family produced a popular YouTube channel, Camp Travel Explore. Alas, we couldn't stay in the campground in Cloudland Canyon for the work week, as the cell service was too intermittent. So we canceled the remainder of our reservation and moved to nearby Nickajack Lake, where we were graced by a visit from Barrett Schichtel, AKA the Gimpy Camper on YouTube. From Lookout Mountain, we made a beeline due west across the northern end of the Gulf Coast states to Arkansas to visit Hot Springs National Park in time for the July 4th holiday for our episode 162. Hot Springs National Park is unique in our country's national park system in that it focuses on a preservation of some urban structures, yet it includes some beautiful natural areas as well. It is centered around Bathhouse Row currently consisting of eight bathhouse buildings that were constructed between 1892 and 1923, the grandest collection of bathhouses of its kind in North America. By the time we left Hot Springs, it was mid-July. After moving every weekend since mid-May, we honestly needed a break. So for our episode 163, we stayed on for two full weeks in the lakeside campground on Table Rock Lake at the Port of Kimberling outside of the resort town of Branson, Missouri. We explored Branson and its surroundings a bit, including a full day with Rod and Vicki Blakeney of the Instagram RV Quest for Adventure but spent most of our two weeks soaking up the sun and relaxing on the lake, with a little bit of kayaking thrown in too.
were also at a crossroads. From here, our original plan called for us to head west across Kansas and Colorado to arrive back in Utah in August. But we were enjoying our time on the road and nothing was really calling us home. After pondering our options for a few nights, we broke camp and headed north instead. That brought us into central Illinois, to the land of Lincoln for our episode 164. Camping right at Lincoln's New Salem State Historic Site, adjacent to the historical recreation of New Salem, where Abraham Lincoln spent life in his 20s. Our location also afforded us the opportunity to explore numerous historical sites around the Springfield area, dedicated to our nation's 16th president, including the Lincoln Home National Historic Site, Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum, the historic Springfield Depot, where Lincoln left for his presidential inauguration and delivered his bittersweet farewell address to Springfield, as well as Lincoln's tomb. We were already northbound, so why not continue in that direction? In our episode 165, we made it within 20 miles of our campground reservation in Door County, Wisconsin, where we experienced our second wheel bearing failure of the summer, necessitating our second axle replacement. But after a couple of nights spent in the back lot of an RV dealership, we managed to continue our journey to Beantown Campground in Bailey's Harbor. Dork County is sometimes referred to as the Cape Cod of the Midwest. It's a peninsula that juts out into Lake Michigan, bounded by the lake on its east and Green Bay on its west. It's home to beautiful beaches, historic lighthouses, rolling fruit orchards, and beautiful resort towns, harbors, and marinas.
I even got to experience floating 500 feet above the deep blue waters of Lake Michigan for the very first time, parasailing with Wisconsin water wings. It was almost enough to make me forget about our axle issues. Just continuing a bit further north brought us to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan for our episode 166 at Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore. By the second week of August at another great lake, Lake Superior. We explored the National Lakeshore from end to end, including hiking to picturesque rock formations, waterfalls and massive sand dunes dropping right to the crystal clear water. Continuing further north would have required gills and fins, so we turned our truck west to the UP's Keweenaw Peninsula for our episode 167. The UP is already way up north, but the Keweenaw Peninsula is the northernmost portion of the UP and was the site of the first copper boom in the United States. While we were in the area, there was one more thing on the South Shore of Lake Superior that I absolutely had to see. 
It's the lure of kayaking into the famed sea caves of the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore that drew us to the most northern point in Wisconsin. But while there, we were positively smitten with the beauty of the Bayfield Peninsula throughout our episode 168. Westward Ho! The waters of Lake Itasca in northwestern Minnesota spill through the outlet and form a tiny stream that becomes our nation's most important river, traveling for more than 2,500 miles to the Gulf of Mexico. We visited the Mississippi headwaters and the Detroit Lakes area of Minnesota in our episode 169. Of course, no visit to northwestern Minnesota would have been complete without meeting the legendary lumberjack Paul Bunyan in his Blue Ox Bay at his birthplace of Bemidji.
Not much further west of Detroit Lake sits Fargo, right on the Red River at the border of North Dakota. We don't mean to sell Fargo short, but we weren't expecting a lot from North Dakota's most populous city. Sometimes though, your expectations are low, so you end up being pleasantly surprised while filming our episode 170. Sites worth seeing in the Fargo area include a Viking ship replica that actually crossed the Atlantic in an amazing assortment of aircraft on display at the Fargo Air Museum. It was now Labor Day weekend and we had no campsite reservations for the holiday. We figured that our best strategy was to head to a tiny first come, first served $10 campground operated by Northwood, a small town in Eastern North Dakota that's as far off the radar as possible. While there, we were hit with a unique idea for our episode 171. Tell the story of life in small town America using only our camera lens and without ever leaving Northwood. Life in Devil's Lake, North Dakota is all about fishing and fishing. A little bit of duck hunting and more fishing. But we found lots of other fun things to see and do in the area that we shared in our episode 172.
For our episode 173, we stayed at the smallest town that we stayed in all summer. Robinson, North Dakota has a population that tops out at a whopping 37 people. Walking around town is like touring a living museum of life on the Northern Prairie. We hooked up to the local volunteer firehouse to explore the nearby ghost town of Arena, where no one has lived for nearly 40 years. By the time we arrived in the western North Dakota cowboy town of Medora, it was mid-September, and things were very much winding down for the season. That, however, was the perfect time to see the area and explore Theodore Roosevelt National Park for our episode 174.
From Adora, our route back to Utah took us to the Black Hills of South Dakota for our episode 175. Our visit to the area could not have been more fortuitous. Entirely by chance, great friendships were cultivated with viewers Katie and Kent Arnold of Nebraska and Kay and Tim McNulty of Texas. And we had no idea whatsoever that our visit to Custer State Park would coincide with the park's annual Buffalo Roundup. Custer State Park rivals many national parks in size and natural beauty. World-class recreation available in the park includes hiking and kayaking and spectacular drives along the Wildlife Loop, Needles Highway, and Iron Mountain Road for more sedentary days. Leaving Custer, the only state between us and home was Wyoming, and we chose to spend a week in the area around Pinedale for our episode 176. Now, when many travelers think of Wyoming, they think only of Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks, but there's a whole lot more to see and do across the rest of Wyoming, too.
Excellent. Museum of the Mountain Man in Pinedale explains the Western fur trade that dominated this region for the first half of the 19th century and contributed to the discovery and exploration of the American West. After visiting the museum, we headed out across the countryside in search of the historical sites that we learned about. After returning home, I had one more outing to enjoy in our Evo travel trailer. My sister Lauren was visiting from Boston and had never before been RV camping. So she got a taste at one of our go-to spots close to home, the Wedge in the San Rafael Swell of Central Utah. But years of travel and many bumpy miles had taken its toll on the wall structure of our Evo. And the trip to the Wedge was to be that trailer's final voyage. In October, we traded it in for a new Durango fifth wheel to begin the next phase of our RV lives as full-time travelers. So while I doubt that many of us will be shedding a tear to put 2020 in the rearview mirror come January 1st, it did hold a few very pleasant surprises with us that we were able to share with you throughout the year. Uh, this is likely to be the last episode that we film here in our home as our transition to a full-time lifestyle is now nearly complete. Our full-time date is less than a week away and as you can see the house is looking a little barren Got a bunch of stuff stacked up in boxes behind me ready to go. We've been selling off a ton of stuff, giving away even more. Got a dumpster outside for everything that we haven't been able to sell or give away that we're just filling, pretty much adopting a rule that if I haven't seen this item or needed it in the past two years, it's going one way or the other. We wanted to wish you and all of your families a very Merry Christmas season. If you like this video, please give us a big thumbs up down below. Also down below, you'll find the comment section. That's where we love to hear from you after each episode. Now we air outdoor adventure RV travel episodes each and every Wednesday. So if you're not yet a grand adventurer, this is the perfect time. Go smash that little red subscribe button, the one right down there in the corner of your screen, and ring that notification bell to be sure that you come along on each and every grand adventure. And until next week, Please remember, life is nothing but a grand adventure. Merry Christmas. 
We'll see you next week.